welcome back to Bumblebee Yield Hunks and Monks. Today's video requires an empty stomach, a big appetite, and a little open mindedness. The top 10 gross medieval foods peasants ate. There are over 50 handwritten medieval cooking manuscripts still in existence today. Some are lists of recipes in included in apothecary manuals or other books of medical remedies. Others focus on descriptions of grand feasts alone, but all are devoted to recording the many dishes of the medieval kitchen, such as the forbidden omelet. It's not really an omelet actually, it's more like if you cut a pancake like slab out of the color canary yellow. Back in medieval times, Lent and the other billion days they spent fasting were a miserable affair where Christians ate like lentils and dried fish every day for a month. The English came up with a solution for this tiresome diet, the tansy, a sweet and savory dish that was somewhere between a pancake and a vegan omelet. Tansies took their name from the tantatum vulgar herb that grew across the country at that time in great abundance. Eventually a lot more ingredients were added to tansies such as parsley, feverfew, almonds, breadcrumbs, nutmeg, cream, and butter. Ironically, despite the love of tansies and the fact this plant was used to treat medical ailments, it was later discovered to be poisonous. Dangerous to consume, rub on skin, the whole nine yards of poison. Hilariously, that did not stop the English from quite literally driving it to extinction. No more tansies now. And what could possibly be more tasty than something that you can make laxatives out of, perfume, and car oil? It's whale vomit. Ambergris is often considered as one of the world's strangest natural occurrences, and it's been used as an ingredient in food and drink alone for hundreds of years. Europeans used ambergris as medication for headaches, colds, epilepsy, and other ailments. The first reported use of ambergris in perfumery comes from Muslim Spain. It has been used for flavoring everything from cigarettes to Turkish coffee and even hot chocolate. If you like the TV show Bob's Burgers, you may know it from their episode titled as such, where the kids find a big old chunk of it washed up ashore in their wharf town, something that does still happen nowadays, so keep your eye out for what looks like a giant chunk of earwax at the beach. Formed in the intestinal tracts of sperm whales over decades, ambergris is a grayish brown waxy substance that some scientists believe is produced by whales to help ease the passage of objects they have eaten that they can't digest before expelling the same way whales expel fecal waste. Usually found floating in the sea or washed up on beaches, ambergris has not only been the foodstuff of choice for royalty, but it's also been a firm favorite of the perfume industry even today thanks to its strong and lingering scent. Nowadays, ambergris has fallen out of favor as a food additive, possibly because people found out what it does and where it came from, but it's still used in the perfume industry apart from in countries where it's banned, such as Australia and the United States. Another absolutely bizarre natural occurrence they enjoyed was the open arse, the rudest entry on this list by a country mile. Open arses were actually a commonly consumed variety of apple in medieval ages, and they do not look appetizing. What is that? It looks like a Photoshop project of a potato, persimmon, and a crab apple put together. I would say don't judge a book by its cover, but the inside is an effing mess too. Look at that. Who thought that was edible? Who said, look, that looks tasty. Give me a bite. Literally has the composition of a moldy peach. According to the interwebs, the apple got its rather vulgar nickname from its appearance of the underside. The calces, which normally look like this on an apple, are very large, and they're spread apart on an open arse, giving the underside of an apple a distinctly certain exit human appearance. Somehow, looking like that and being still called an open arse, the apple managed to pick up popularity in the 13th century and remain popular for cooking well into the 17th. Dying of fever or just in the mood for an inconvenient hard to cook dish, well you may want to consider roast rodent. Those little roly polies, hedgehogs were considered a cure for everything from sore throat to leprosy. Their fat and intestines were considered the most viable. Hedgehogs may seem like an unlikely source of nourishment for us today, not just because of their prickly spines, yet their quills didn't deter determined chefs of the past globally, especially in medieval times when they prepared roasted hedgehogs by gutting and trussing them just like pullet. The hedgehogs were then roasted and then only after they were pressed in a towel to dry and served with cameline sauce or wrapped in pastry and then broiled again. A piece of advice, if, if you're trying to roast a hedgehog and it refuses to unroll, simply take the dead body and put it in hot water. Or at least that's what the recipe books say. It's gross now, it was gross then, but hell do we love it, it's fast food. Stopping for a few minutes to pick up a meat pie for lunch was as common as hitting the 
the drive-thru today and just as likely to give you diarrhea. Just back then, diarrhea would probably kill you. Fast food cooks were notorious for using diseased or undercooked meat or just warming up yesterday's spoiled leftovers. Again, not very different from what goes on at the back of Taco Hell or Taco Bell. Fast foods of London of the late 13th and early 14th century contained easy, portable foods much like today's Big Mac. Meat pies, hotcakes, tansies, and wafers. These meat pies, called umble pies, consisted of edible entrails from deer or wild animals, generally just scrap meat. These cook shops functioned like medieval drive throughs where customers walked up and put an order at the window. The food was being mass prepared, then individually produced. They toss your little pie in the flames right there, pull her out a second later, and there you go, enjoy your entrails and wheat. In many urban areas, one street became known as the fast food capital for the city. In Bristol, Cook's Row catered to the customers looking for fast, tasty food. As a result of these innovative fast food kitchens, professional cook emerged during the medieval period employed at the great estates and in smaller shops of urban centers. So they colonized half the world for spices, but aren't the best at using them. It's sugar and spice and not so nice sauce. Spices were stupid expensive because Western Europe isn't exactly known for fiery flora or flavorful plants. And the only real means of transportation tended to die if you rode them too far, horses. So obviously you're just getting rare bits of dried herb brought back from crusades that you also have no idea what it is or how to use. And that's only if you're wealthy too. A lot of recipes described the peasants and even the wealthy seasonings as vinegar, ginger, garlic, chopped bread, unripe apples, and almond milks. AKA most people were limited to flavoring their foods with whatever BS they had lying around. Mostly the tart or sour, leading to the modern British tradition of refusing to eat food that actually tastes like anything. Like spices, sugar was so expensive that it blackened rotten teeth became a status symbol. It was so coveted that when it finally became cheaper and more accessible to the average person in the 16th century, people went nuts. They were rolling meat in it, vegetables, and probably themselves. People tried to liven up their bland ass food with sauces, but the limited access to dairy and tomatoes were still a twinkle in the eyes of the colonizers. And these sauces, they weren't the sort of thing you'd want to dip your pizza rolls in as a result. At the beginning of the medieval period, sauces were based on milk or wine or butter, or simply the au jus which emerged as part of the cooking process. Because bread was so important to the overall caloric intake and to maintaining the consistent mold and food poisoning that was killing them all, flour could not be wasted to prepare sauces and gravies, except on the tables of the rich. Their sauces were more like oatmeal, which you'd only serve on vegetables today if you want to ruin them. To give you an idea, one sauce is gruel, it's pounded oatmeal mixed with broth. Oh man, what a treat. Next up is beaver tails, but not the bannock type. Usually saying beaver tail, you think of that sweet, fluffy fried dough covered in sugar, maybe ice cream that's found at carnivals or amusement parks, or that hometown restaurant that sells them for $6.50 even though they're the size of your head. But medieval beaver tail? Whole different animal. Wait, well, whatever. Anyways, as discussed, medieval peasants were fasting like three fourths of the year. That's a long time. So the church compromised by simply forbidding people to eat meat during fasting holidays and then compromised further by agreeing fish isn't meat. But why stop there? People went even further by deciding certain parts of animals found in water that kind of looked like a fish, like a beaver's tail, counted as fish. Beaver tails were similar in shape to flatfish if you used your imagination. They looked like they were covered in scales and they spent a lot of time underwater, therefore they're actually fish. And they provided a cheap stand-in for the country's fishless poorer masses. But again, why stop there? The 17th century was no longer just the tail that was allowed on fast days, but the whole beaver itself. The beaver was a fish due to the fact it was an excellent swimmer. Unsurprisingly, the 17th century is the same year the beaver goes extinct thanks to overconsumption. Now the beaver is thriving once more again in England, Wales, and Scotland thanks to su successful reintroduction programs from Canada, because we stay carrying that team. A medieval peasant walks into a bar and orders a drink and has to correct the bartender because they ordered a cock ale, not a cocktail. This hilariously named beer was made by tossing a boiled and crushed dead cockerel with four pounds of raisins, nutmeg, mace, and a half pound of dates inside a canvas bag. The bag was then placed in ale and left there to steep for six or seven days. It was then bottled and kept still for a month, after which ready for consumption. This was the most popular recipe as shared in a 1669 news article by Kelnan Digby. Why was this done to beer when it was already medieval times and it tasted bad enough? Well, it wasn't to produce dead chicken flavored beer, which is why strong herbs were there to overpower the chicken. The reason for ruining perfectly good beer with a giant chicken tea bag stemmed from the belief that the beer would be imparted with the cockerel's characteristics 
mix of strength, vigor, and courage. It was therefore mainly drunk by big manly men who wanted to be even bigger and even more manly. It was described as a pleasant drink, said to be provocative, aka it excited lust and aroused the body. In 19th century dictionary slang, cock ale was directly identified as a homely aphrodisiac. However, it naturally fell out of favor eventually for beer that didn't taste like dead chickens. I'm super angry about this one, but apparently it was only done in times of serious famine. It's roast cat. Cats were considered highly useful in keeping pests and vermin away. Dogs weren't so much of a commonplace thing, and usually they were the first to be eaten pet wise when it came to serious food shortages. However, if the going gets tough, you have the option of hunting down some ferals in the woods to feed the fam. So, ever wonder how to roast a cat? According to one medieval recipe, you start off by cutting off the head and tossing it away because it is not for eating. They, for they say that eating the brains will cause him who eats them to lose his senses and judgment. Then you do the cleaning. At this stage, the feline may look ready to roast, but alas, you must first bury it in the ground for a day and a night before you do. Then you unbury it, spit it, roast it, and whip it with a green stick. You can serve the roasted cat by soaking it in broth and garlic. To quote the end of the recipe, and you may eat it because it is very good food, which I feel like they threw in because they knew folks were not sold on eating dead ground food. And of course, what better to end this list than literal garbage, a real literal actual name for a medieval dish. The historical food blogs are fighting for their lives to try and say this recipe is super tasty. And they've used the old recipe to make it at home. I do not believe you. I will die on this hill. This is probably the worst titled dish in history and its ingredient list does not improve it. I have found four recipes and each is just worse than the rest, all going as far back as 1393. So most generically, you're gonna need all the worst parts of a chicken. You need the head, the, the livers, the gizzards. Throw them into a nice pot. Add fresh beef broth, powder, pepper, cinnamon, cloves, mace, parsley, sage, all chopped small. Then take bread, like actual bread. Just take a whole loaf and just put that in the pot. Boil it, then put it through a strainer, then boil it again. Add powdered ginger, verjuice, which is unripe apple juice, mmm, salt, and a little saffron. Then serve it forth. To have it English style means leaving the pieces of animal and chunks in there. When you serve it, having it French style is to strain it once more and serve it just as a thin broth. Imagine making it brothy soup style, serving that to your buddies before telling them afterwards what they ate. All right, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more from us and until next time, comment down below if you've ever tried medieval recipes, funk or flavor.